Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Cemeteries have long been places of quiet reflection and remembrance. But beneath their serene exteriors, they hold secrets that have fascinated and frightened people for centuries. From the ancient burial practices of the Egyptians and Greeks to the haunting tales of Highgate Cemetery and Greyfriars Kirkyard, we'll explore why cemeteries are believed to be hotspots for paranormal activity. We'll touch on both the folklore and the rational theories behind ghostly encounters as well as the three types of spirits you might encounter in a cemetery. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… Did pterosaurs, the ancient flying reptiles, truly vanish millions of years ago, or do they still soar through our skies? We'll look at claims of modern-day sightings, some controversial theories, and a tantalizing photograph that challenges their extinction. Could these prehistoric flying giants still be among us, in hiding? Ever driven down a dark, winding country road and felt the hair on the back of your neck stand up? It's very possible you did if you were traveling down Sleepy Hollow Road. This isn't the Washington Irving tale of a hamlet in New York State. This is an infamous road in Kentucky with eerie legends of ghostly hearses, time warps, satanic rituals, and haunted bridges. In the picturesque village of Bennington, Vermont, 18-year-old Paula Jean Weldon disappeared on a chilly December afternoon in 1946. The case took many twists, including a fruitless search in the wilderness, misleading clues, and even the formation of the Vermont State Police due to criticism of the investigation. To this day, Paula's fate remains unknown. In 1968, Spain experienced an unprecedented wave of UFO and humanoid sightings that left many mystified, terrified, and mesmerized. From encounters with mysterious figures in homes to bizarre sightings outdoors, 1968 had the entire country of Spain talking about aliens from outer space. Despite humanity's efforts to control nature, Sometimes the natural world pushes back in unexpected and chaotic ways, from a pigeon poop-induced blackout in Japan to a squirrel terrorizing a Welsh town. Animals can disrupt our lives, and sometimes in humorous ways. On a stormy night in April 1893, two condemned prisoners at Sing Sing Prison blinded a guard with pepper spray and executed a daring escape down the Hudson River that left authorities baffled and the public enthralled. But first, cemeteries are more than just resting places for the dead. They're steeped in history, emotion, and some believe paranormal activity. We'll explore the eerie tales and scientific theories that make these hallowed grounds a focal point for ghostly encounters. We begin there. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Cemeteries, with their quiet gravestones and serene landscapes, have long been places of reflection and remembrance. But for some, these peaceful resting places are also filled with whispers from the past and unexplained phenomena. The idea of spirits in cemeteries has fascinated people for centuries, giving rise to countless ghost stories and legends. 
In this episode, we'll explore the intriguing world of cemetery spirits and examining the reason why these places are often associated with paranormal activity. To understand why cemeteries are thought to be haunted, it's important to delve into their history. Cemeteries, graveyards, or simple burial grounds have existed since ancient times. Early humans buried their dead in caves or simple graves, often leaving behind items for the afterlife. As societies evolved, so did burial practices, leading to the creation of elaborate tombs and cemeteries. In many cultures, cemeteries were considered sacred spaces where the living could connect with their ancestors. This reverence for burial grounds often stemmed from beliefs in the afterlife and the presence of spirits. For example, the ancient Egyptians built magnificent pyramids and tombs, believing that the spirits of the dead needed a proper resting place to transition to the afterlife. The belief in spirits, or the souls of the deceased, is common in many cultures and religions. Spirits are often thought to linger in places that were significant to them in life or where they experienced strong emotions. Cemeteries, being the final resting place for many, naturally become associated with spirits. There are several types of spirits commonly believed to inhabit cemeteries, but the main three are residual spirits, intelligent spirits, and guardian spirits. Residual spirits are thought to be imprints of past events or emotions. They don't interact with the living but instead replay specific moments from their lives, much like a recording. Intelligent spirits are believed to have consciousness and can interact with the living. They may try to communicate through various means, such as EVP that's electronic voice phenomena, or by appearing as apparitions. Guardian spirits believe that these spirits watch over their loved one's graves, providing protection and comfort. Several factors contribute to the belief that cemeteries are haunted. Emotional Energy Cemeteries are places of great emotional significance. They are where people mourn the loss of their loved ones, and this intense emotional energy is thought to attract spirits. The sorrow, grief, and love expressed in cemeteries create an atmosphere that some believe make it easier for spirits to manifest. Historical Significance Many cemeteries are old, with graves dating back centuries. The long history of these places means that countless individuals have been buried there, each with their own stories and experiences. This rich tapestry of history adds to the mystique of cemeteries and the idea that spirits from different eras might coexist in these spaces. Rituals and Ceremonies Funerals and burial ceremonies are deeply symbolic and often involve rituals meant to honor the dead. In some cultures, these rituals include calling upon the spirits of ancestors or performing rites to ensure a smooth transition to the afterlife. These practices can reinforce the belief that cemeteries are inhabited by spirits. Throughout the world, there are cemeteries renowned for their ghostly legends. Here are just a few examples. Highgate Cemetery in London Highgate Cemetery is one of the most famous haunted cemeteries in the world. Established in 1839, it's the final resting place for many notable figures, including Karl Marx. Highgate's known for its Victorian Gothic architecture and eerie atmosphere. Many visitors have reported seeing ghostly figures and hearing strange noises, particularly near the grave of the Highgate Vampire, a mysterious apparition said to haunt the area. I covered that story in a previous episode. Do a search for Highgate Vampire at WeirdDarkness.com to give it a listen. Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris Père Lachaise Cemetery is the largest cemetery in Paris and one of the most visited in the world. It is the burial place of famous individuals like Oscar Wilde, Jim Morrison, and Edith Piaf. The cemetery's labyrinthine layout and ancient tombs add to its haunted reputation. Visitors often leave letters and offerings at the graves of their favorite artists, and some claim to have felt their presence or seen apparitions. St. Louis Cemetery No. 1, New Orleans New Orleans is a city known for its rich history and vibrant culture, and its cemeteries are no exception. St. Louis Cemetery No. 1 is the oldest and most famous of the city's burial grounds. It is the final resting place of voodoo queen Marie Laveau, whose spirit is said to still wander the cemetery. Many visitors report seeing her ghost or experiencing other supernatural phenomena. 
and Greyfriars Kirkyard in Edinburgh. Greyfriars Kirkyard in Edinburgh, Scotland is known for its spooky history and ghostly tales. The cemetery dates back to the 16th century and is home to the infamous Mackenzie Poltergeist. This spirit is believed to be the restless ghost of Sir George Mackenzie, a ruthless persecutor of the Covenanters. Visitors to the cemetery have reported being attacked or experiencing unexplained physical sensations near his tomb. Many people have personal stories of encountering spirits in cemeteries. These accounts often involve seeing apparitions, hearing disembodied voices, or feeling an unexplained presence. Here are just a few personal experiences shared by individuals who believe they've encountered spirits in cemeteries. One evening, while visiting a Civil War-era cemetery, a young woman named Emily experienced something she would never forget. As she walked among the graves, she noticed a figure in a soldier's uniform standing by a tombstone. Thinking it was a reenactor, she approached to ask about the history of the cemetery. To her surprise, the figure vanished into thin air before she could speak. Emily later learned that the tombstone belonged to a soldier who had died in battle. She believes she saw his ghost. John, a local historian, often visited an old cemetery to research the area's past. One day, while examining a weathered gravestone, he heard a faint whisper in his ear. The voice seemed to be speaking in an old dialect, and John couldn't make out the words. As he turned to see who was there, he found himself alone. Despite being a skeptic, John couldn't explain the experience and began to consider the possibility of spirits lingering in the cemetery. And Sarah regularly visited her grandmother's grave to leave flowers and pay her respects. On one visit, she felt an overwhelming sense of comfort and warmth, as if someone was hugging her. She looked around, but no one was there. Sarah believes it was her grandmother's spirit, letting her know that she was still watching over her. While many people believe in spirits, others seek scientific explanations for the phenomena reported in cemeteries. Here are a few theories. Environmental factors. Cemeteries are often located in quiet, secluded areas with minimal light pollution. This environment can play tricks on the mind, causing people to see shadows or hear noises they might not notice in a busier setting. Additionally, natural elements like the wind, animals, and weather can create sounds and movements that seem supernatural. Psychological factors The power of suggestion and the human mind's ability to create patterns can lead to ghostly experiences. If someone believes they are in a haunted place, they may be more likely to interpret ordinary occurrences as paranormal. This phenomenon is known as expectancy bias. And electromagnetic fields. Some researchers suggest that fluctuations in electromagnetic fields EMFs, could contribute to feelings of unease or experiences of apparitions. Cemeteries, with their abundance of metal such as fences and gates, and electrical equipment like lighting, can have varying EMF levels that might affect sensitive individuals. Cemeteries have always held a special place in human culture, serving as both final resting places for the deceased and spaces for the living to connect with the past. Whether you believe in spirits or not, the history, emotions, and rituals associated with cemeteries make them fascinating, if not eerie, places to explore, especially at night. If you go in with respect and an open mind, you might just catch a glimpse of the spirits that are said to reside within. When Weird Darkness Returns There is a second Sleepy Hollow you might not have been aware of, Sleepy Hollow Road in Kentucky, and it too has eerie legends attached to it. Plus, Paula Jean Weldon disappeared on a chilly December afternoon in 1946. The case took many twists, including a fruitless search in the wilderness, misleading clues, and to this day, Paula's fate remains unknown. But first, on a stormy night in April 1893, two condemned prisoners at Sing Sing Prison blinded a guard with pepper spray and executed a daring escape down the Hudson River that left authorities baffled and the public enthralled. That story is up next.
Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or So Bad It's Good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Sing Sing Prison perched on the Hudson River in New York State, has long been known for its infamous death house. This separate building, attached to the south end of the main prison, housed up to eight condemned men in 8 by 10 cells along the south wall. Each cell, separated by brick partitions, was secured with iron bars. The death house included a notorious feature – a lean-to building at the corridor's end, housing the electric chair installed in 1891. On July 7, 1891, four condemned murderers were the first to be electrocuted, setting a grim precedent. By April 1893, the death house had five inmates awaiting their fate. Among them were Carlisle W. Harris, John L. Osmond, Michael Gojigan, Frank Roll, and Thomas Pallister. A 24-hour death watch ensured no suicides or escapes with keepers rotating shifts to maintain constant vigilance. Yet on the stormy night of April 20, 1893, an audacious escape plan unfolded. Around 7 p.m., Thomas Pallister, claiming illness and hunger, asked keeper Hulse to warm a plate of meat and potatoes. When Hulse opened the cell door to deliver the food, Pallister threw a handful of pepper into his eyes, blinding him temporarily. Pallister then overpowered Hulse, taking his keys and revolver. With Hulse locked in his own cell, Pallister freed his fellow inmate, Frank Roll. Brandishing the revolver, Pallister threatened Hulse, ensuring silence under the threat of death. They waited for the arrival of the next Death Watch guard, Keeper Murphy, overpowering and locking him up as well. Pallister then offered freedom to Harris, Osmond, and Joe Geegan. They all refused. Harris, in particular, believed he would be proven innocent and saw no value in escape. Pallister and Roll climbed to the top of the cells, broke through the skylight with an iron bar, and escaped onto the roof. They then jumped off the one-story building into the stormy night. The heavy rain and strong winds meant no guards were on watch outside, allowing the escapees to steal a prison rowboat and row down the Hudson River. The escape wasn't discovered until 5.40 a.m. the next morning, when the new Death Watch keepers arrived. The alarm was raised, and Warden Brown launched a massive search for the fugitives. New York State Detective James Jackson, a veteran with 20 years of experience capturing fugitives for Sing Sing, led the hunt. He telegraphed towns along both sides of the Hudson, offering a $250 reward for each man's capture. The escape spurred a wave of sightings and speculations. Railroad workers reported seeing three men boarding a train, while a mysterious schooner was spotted speeding past Yonkers towards New York City. The New York City police were skeptical, suspecting foul play and questioning the feasibility of Pallister's pepper plan. They pointed out that Roll's brother had recently inherited a substantial sum, suggesting possible bribery. Warden Brown and Principal Keeper Connaughton denied any collusion, but the incident led to the suspension and eventual firing of Hulse, Murphy, and other guards on duty. The search continued, with sightings reported from various locations, including New Jersey and Massachusetts. However, none of these leads proved fruitful. On May 10th, 
three fishermen found Frank Roll's body floating in the Hudson River. His skull had been crushed and he had been shot in the head. Detective Jackson identified the body through personal items found in Roll's pockets. Speculation arose that Pallister had killed Roll before escaping or that river pirates were involved. Six days later, fishermen discovered a second body, identified as Thomas Pallister by distinctive tattoos. He had been shot under the left eye, and his death was also shrouded in mystery. The coroner's jury ruled the deaths as caused by unknown persons, but theories abounded. Some believed the men had a fatal disagreement, while others suspected they preferred death to capture. The prison even faced accusations of staging the bodies to cover up an internal conspiracy. And to this day, everyone is still guessing. The village of Bennington, Vermont is an idyllic corner of New England that would have no particular notoriety were it not for Paula Jean Weldon. One chilly December afternoon in 1946, the 18-year-old sophomore left her room at Bennington College to go on a hike and was never seen again. The mystery began on December 1, 1946. Paula worked a double shift in the college dining hall, spent some time with her roommate Elizabeth Johnson, and then decided to go out for a while. According to Johnson, Paula was dressed in a distinctive red parka coat with a fur-lined hood, blue jeans, topsider shoes with thick soles, and a gold Elgin wristwatch with a black band. She also remembered Paula's last words, I'm all through with studies, I'm taking a long walk. Paula's long walk was to be along part of Vermont's Long Trail, which in total runs 272 miles from the Massachusetts state line to the Canadian border. The cold weather and Paula's outfit suggested that Paula had not planned on being out longer than a few hours. Shortly after, Paula, or a girl in similar clothing with the same physical description, was spotted by Danny Fager. Fager owned a gas station across the street from the college gates and alleged that he'd seen the girl run up and then down the side of a gravel pit near the college entrance. This would have occurred just after Paula's departure from her room, around 2.45 p.m. Fifteen minutes later, a man named Louis Knapp claimed to have picked up a young girl hitchhiking on Route 67A near the college. Knapp remembered her appearance as being consistent with Paula's and also recalled a seemingly insignificant exchange between himself and the girl. While climbing into his truck, the girl lost her footing. Knapp told her to be careful, but said nothing else until letting her out on Route 9, near the Long Trail. Just before 4 p.m., Paula was seen again, this time by several people in Bickford Hollow, where she appeared to be heading toward the trail. One of those people, Ernie Whitman, warned Paula against traveling into the mountains without heavier clothing. She reportedly ignored him and continued on her way. By the time night fell, Paula's roommate started to worry. Not wanting to arouse any unnecessary panic, Johnson said nothing to college president Lewis Webster Jones until the next morning. Jones phoned Paula's parents to ask if she'd gone home for the weekend. Paula's mother collapsed with worry and was confined to her bed. Paula's father, engineer W. Archibald Weldon, immediately left his Stanford, Connecticut home for Bennington. Upon arriving, Mr. Weldon sprang into action by organizing a massive search party, which included local residents as well as students from Bennington and nearby Williams College. After a full day had passed with no results, most of the students gave up in frustration. Mr. Weldon called in both the New York and Connecticut State Police to help. Vermont had no state police force at the time, but it did have a state investigator named Elmo Franzoni, whose involvement only served to raise a $5,000 reward for information. Days passed with no resolution. Bizarre leads surfaced in different areas, including one from a waitress in Fall River, Massachusetts, who claimed to have served dinner to a disturbed woman fitting Paula's description. Oddly, this struck a chord with Mr. Weldon. He vanished for 36 hours to pursue the lead. However, no one knew where Mr. Weldon had gone until he returned to Bennington. This made some people believe that Mr. Weldon was somehow connected to his daughter's disappearance. 
When other facts began to surface, Mr. Weldon looked even guiltier. Paula and her father reportedly had a falling out over a male suitor, of whom her father disapproved. Mr. Weldon soon theorized that Paula's boyfriend must be the responsible party, but could offer no proof to substantiate his claims other than to say a clairvoyant from Pownall, Vermont, told him so. On December 16th, Mr. Weldon admonished the police for their lack of professionalism and returned to Connecticut. He was particularly aghast that no records had been kept for the first ten days of the investigation. Once reporters caught wind of this, they descended on Bennington and jotted down everything they could find. The negative press eventually led to the creation of the Vermont State Police in July 1947. Search parties continued on the long trail, but poor weather eventually forced the last willing participants to turn away, feeling that any last remains of Paula Jean Weldon would most likely be covered and undetectable. Nine years after Paula's disappearance, a lumberjack came forward. He claimed he had been in Bickford Hollow when Paula went missing, and he also claimed to know where her body was buried. Attorney Reuben Levin questioned the man incessantly until the man admitted to making it all up for publicity. Then in 1968, a skeleton was found. Investigators scrambled excitedly, hoping to finally bring closure to the aging cold case. But again, their hopes were dashed. It was determined that the remains were far too old to be Paula. Independent analyses of the Paula Jean Weldon case have led to the usual conclusions. She became lost and died in the elements, or she ran off with a boyfriend. One of the eerier theories points to the Bennington Triangle, a notorious section of southwestern Vermont where five people, including Paula, vanished between 1945 and 1950. Individuals such as New England author Joseph Citro believe that Paula's disappearance has an otherworldly explanation. Officially, the unsolved case of Paula Jean Weldon remains open, though it is unlikely that it will ever be solved. Since teenagers started driving, one of the rites of passage, at least for those who live near real dark country, are nocturnal drives down creepy old roads. It's my personal theory that the golden age of haunted country roads was the early to mid-1970s, when it became pretty common for teens to have their own cars and marijuana use was on the rise. Sure, kids still do the same routine stone sober, as well as under the mind-bending effects of beer, but stoners were not only more likely to tell people about it, they were also more likely to embellish the stories in new and creative ways. If you live in or near Louisville, Kentucky, it's quite likely you've heard the stories of Sleepy Hollow Road, a winding two-lane blacktop near the town of Prospect in Jefferson County. With a tree line that becomes a canopy in many places, at night there's nothing but headlights to light your way, as even the light of the full moon never finds its way to the pavement for much of its length. The state thoughtfully installed guardrails, as the drop-off is steep and over 30 feet to the bottom in some places. Not the kind of curve you want to miss. In daylight, it's actually quite beautiful, and like its namesake in the Hudson Valley, it is eerily still and ominous in its dark shadows. Settlers found their way into this corner of northern Kentucky quite early, certainly by the turn of the 19th century. But most of the stories certainly have much newer sources, which is why I bring up the penchant of young people to explore the dark and creepy by automobile. One of the most famous legends associated with Sleepy Hollow Road is the story of the mysterious black hearse. According to the tale, drivers often spot headlights in their rearview mirror, coming up fast and close. At first, they think it might be friends playing a prank or perhaps the police about to pull them over. But as the vehicle gets closer, they realize with horror that it's a hearse with tinted black windows. The hearse allegedly tries to run drivers off the road, forcing them down the steep embankment. This story is hard to imagine in horse and buggy days, but it fits perfectly into the era of teenage drivers and spooky night drives. The presence of Harrods Creek Cemetery just beyond the terminus of Sleepy Hollow Road and Sleepy Hollow Golf Course gives a plausible reason for a hearse to be traveling this road. 
This legend also provides a creative, albeit unbelievable, excuse for why a stoned driver might find themselves at the bottom of a ravine. Another popular tale is that of the Time Warp. Some who drive into Sleepy Hollow find upon leaving the valley that hours have passed, even though it felt only like minutes. This phenomenon is one of the charming effects of marijuana, which can warp one's sense of time. While this story seems far-fetched, the combination of darkness, disorientation, and altered states of mind makes it somewhat plausible. From the 1970s to the 1980s, an area just off Sleepy Hollow Road, known as Devil's Point, was rumored to be the site of satanic rituals and black masses. Residents reported hearing ominous chanting and screaming breaking the stillness of the night. Brave souls who investigated claimed to see bonfires and people in black robes performing rituals. This tale is similar to legends from other parts of the country, such as Mount Misery Road in Sweet Hollow, near Melville on Long Island, New York. These stories often take on the character of the place name rather than the place name being based on the legends. Where the pavement crosses Height Creek on Sleepy Hollow Road, there once stood a covered bridge. Legend has it that from an earlier bridge, mothers would toss unwanted, crippled, or otherwise burdensome babies into the deep pools below, which eventually wash into the nearby Ohio River. According to the tale, when the moon shines down on the bridge and the night is still, you can hear the screams and cries of these hapless victims, as well as the mournful wails of their doomed mothers. While it's hard to believe such an abomination could be a regular occurrence, it's possible that it happened once or twice in the past. Human cruelty and desperation can lead to dark deeds. These tales passed down through generations might have originated elsewhere, but found new homes in places like Sleepy Hollow Road. They served as both entertainment and a practical purpose, warning children away from dangerous locations. Stories like these have always been a part of human culture. They provide a sense of mystery and excitement, especially for young people looking for a thrill. Sleepy Hollow Road, with its eerie atmosphere and dark legends, attracts more traffic than other similar roads in the area. Whether the stories are true or not doesn't really matter. In many ways, it's our legends that define us, and it's likely that the legends of Sleepy Hollow Road will continue to attract young and old for years to come. Coming up, in 1968, Spain experienced an unprecedented wave of UFO and humanoid sightings that left many mystified, terrified, and mesmerized. From encounters with mysterious figures in homes to bizarre sightings outdoors, 1968 had the entire country of Spain talking about aliens from outer space. And then, despite humanity's efforts to control nature, sometimes the natural world pushes back in unexpected and chaotic ways from a pigeon poop-induced blackout in Japan to a squirrel terrorizing a Welsh town, animals can disrupt our lives, and sometimes in humorous ways. These stories are on the way. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, Please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. 
Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. One curious aspect of the UFO phenomenon is how many sightings seem to come in waves, with numerous witnesses coming forward in the same area within a short span of time. This pattern is true not only for UFOs, but also for their supposed occupants. Paranormal researcher and author Albert S. Rosales uncovered one such wave of encounters from 1968 in Spain and has shared a selection of bizarre reports from that year. Here we explore a country that at the time seemed to be besieged by an array of humanoid sightings and high strangeness. Many of the reports from 1968 occurred right in people's own homes, suggesting that the safety of one's room was not enough to protect from the strange. One such case involved Ventura Munoz from Colmenarejo, Madrid. One night, as Munoz was drifting off to sleep, he was pulled from its clutches by a deep voice calling out to him. He sat up and saw a large, dark humanoid shape materialize before him. His eyes described as an intense red, very persuasive and perverse. The figure offered Munoz anything he desired, but Munoz refused and began praying. As soon as he started praying, the entity simply melted away into the darkness, never to be seen again. In another incident, an eight-year-old girl in Malaga, Spain woke up to see three small humanoid figures with large heads and rough skin standing in her bedroom. These entities took her to a craft outside where they performed an examination and implanted some sort of device in her body. The details of her experience remain a conundrum. Similarly, Julia G., another eight-year-old from Hulva, Spain, woke up to find a dark-skinned woman that was at the same time extremely luminous looming over her bed. The woman, dressed in a white robe, stood there, smiling at Julia, who hid under her covers. When Julia peeked out, the figure was gone. Many encounters occurred outdoors in 1968, adding to the high strangeness of the year. In January, a witness at a boarding school in El Escorial, Madrid, saw a solid, dull-looking, cigar-shaped object while climbing a hill with a friend. They observed it for about 30 seconds before it tilted and vanished. When they returned to school, they discovered they'd been missing for over two hours, although the incident seemed to last only half a minute. In February, a huge, hairy creature resembling Bigfoot was seen drinking from a pond at El Escorial. Other witnesses reported seeing the hairy biped in the area around the same time. In the spring, a 14-year-old working on his father's farm saw two shiny metallic figures resembling metallic robots emerge from the tree line. These figures, about 2.5 meters tall, moved towards him with arms straight down and without moving their legs. Each carried a metallic briefcase. The boy ran home and a search of the area turned up nothing. The spring of 1968 saw several more bizarre encounters. In Monte Ulia, near San Sebastian, Basque Country, a woman saw a bright light descend towards a peach tree in her yard. Two very tall men in white diving suits emerged, wearing what appeared to be wings on their backs. They spoke to her in Spanish, and she lost consciousness. The next morning, she found the area scorched and the tree burnt to a crisp. In another incident, four young girls collecting flowers in Palma de Troya, Andalusia, saw a human-like figure behind a bush. Upon closer inspection, they saw a beautiful woman with a round pink face and large black eyes wearing a brown mantle. The sighting attracted media attention, and many people believed the girls had seen the Holy Virgin Mother. In March, 
a witness near a ruined castle at San Vicente de San Sierra La Rioja, saw three huge humanoid figures with wide shoulders and black hoods carrying scythes. These figures had large, round, red eyes that seemed to blink in unison as they stared at the witness who fled in terror. In the summer, a young man visiting Palmar de Troya with his family to see an apparition of the Virgin Mary saw a humanoid figure resembling a thick bowling pin which had no arms, legs, or discernible facial features. The figure appeared and disappeared within the wooded area. Later, the family saw a glowing cloud moving alongside their car. 1968 continued to bring strange sightings through the summer and into the fall. In August, Pedro Pablo Barrios saw a luminous object shaped like two plates glued together rise into the sky near his vehicle. The object chased him, but when he stopped to observe it, the craft rose and vanished. That same month, rancher Jose Piameo saw two shadowy figures hovering over the ground in a wingless object resembling a canoe. The figures made a sharp turn and disappeared into the brush, leaving Jose's dogs cowering in fear. One of his dogs developed a strange malady and had to be put down days later. In September, a shepherd in Puerto Serrano, Cadiz, saw a round, luminous object emitting bright beams of light. As he approached, he heard voices calling his name before the craft shot into the sky. That same day, a woman in Sedillera La Coruna saw two tall figures with changing colored lights on their faces. A burned area was found at the site later. In November, businessman Francisco Donis received a telepathic message instructing him to go to an isolated location. There, he met a human-like figure named Francisco Atienza, who claimed to be a descendant of extraterrestrials. Atienza explained he came from a planet called Urin, where humans lived under glass domes due to the toxic atmosphere. Two days later, Manuel Trejo's car was struck by an invisible shockwave, causing his car to careen. He saw a humanoid figure covered in tiny lights like a Christmas tree standing in the road. This encounter was followed by a wave of UFO sightings in the area. Reports of strange encounters continued throughout December 1968 until they suddenly dropped off. The variety of descriptions and the sheer number of sightings suggest that something extraordinary was happening in Spain that year. Were these aliens, interdimensional beings, or simply products of overactive imaginations? What was really going on in Spain in 1968. Humans have always sought to control nature, building societies based on the idea that we are the dominant force in the world. However, nature often reminds us of our limitations, especially when animals disrupt our carefully constructed environments. From mischievous behavior to aggressive actions, animals have continually challenged our perceptions of control and coexistence. In 2013, the Nagano Prefecture in Japan experienced a unique event when 25,000 traffic lights suddenly went out, causing a massive traffic jam. The cause was neither a terrorist attack nor a natural disaster, but a pile of pigeon droppings over three feet tall which smothered a local power station's insulator, leading to a blackout. This unexpected event disrupted daily life and highlighted how even seemingly insignificant animals could impact modern infrastructure. Bird droppings have been an issue for electric companies since the early 1900s. According to historical records, bird excrement can corrode metal structures and insulate electrical components, causing short circuits and outages. In the case of Nagano, it took significant effort to clean up the mess and restore power, showing that nature can interfere in our lives in surprising ways. In Japan, if a pigeon relieves itself on you, it's considered a sign of good luck and incoming fortune. Tell that to the people of Nagano. Florida is known for its exotic wildlife, but it's not typically associated with non-human primates. However, due to an overzealous boat captain from a hundred years ago, Florida now hosts a sizable population of wild rhesus macaques on an island in the Silver River. These monkeys were originally brought to the area to attract tourists, but ended up establishing a permanent population. 
In 2010, Juan Macaque decided to explore beyond the island and ventured into the heavily populated Tampa Bay area. This monkey, nicknamed Cornelius, evaded capture for over three years, becoming a local legend with his own Facebook page. Residents shared sightings and updates, turning Cornelius into a folk hero of sorts. During his time on the run, Cornelius became emboldened around humans, likely due to being fed by locals. His increasing aggression culminated in him biting an elderly woman, leading to a concerted effort by wildlife officials to capture him. After a three-hour stakeout, they finally succeeded. Despite his capture, Cornelius remains a beloved figure and now resides in a 22-acre zoo in Dade City, Florida. Gerald was a wild turkey that made his home in the Rose Garden of Oakland, California. Initially peaceful, Gerald's behavior changed dramatically during the early months of the pandemic. As more people visited the Rose Garden to escape their homes, Gerald became increasingly aggressive, targeting visitors with unprovoked attacks. Reports of Gerald's assaults exceeded 100, with more victims escaping unharmed but some sustaining injuries that required medical attention. Gerald's prime targets were children and the elderly, the most vulnerable groups, which intensified the community's concern. Gerald's aggression caused significant conflict within the community, with residents divided on how to handle him. Some wanted him relocated, others believed he should be left alone. The situation escalated on social media, with heated debates and even threats exchanged on platforms like Nextdoor. Officials attempted to recondition Gerald by closing the Rose Garden and trying various capture methods, but Gerald proved elusive. Eventually, a volunteer managed to capture him by pretending to be an elderly woman. Gerald was relocated twice before finding a permanent home on a remote piece of land owned by an electric company. In 2004, a bear named Katya was sentenced to 15 years in a men's penal colony in Kazakhstan for attacking two people at a campsite. With no viable place to hold her, Katya served her sentence among the inmates, who accepted her as one of their own. Katya maintained good standing among the staff and inmates, even having a statue dedicated to her at the colony. Katya's imprisonment was unique, as bears typically do not serve sentences in human institutions. However, Kazakhstan lacked the facilities to house a dangerous bear, leading to this unconventional solution. Katya adapted to her environment, becoming a beloved figure among the inmates and staff. In 2019, Katya was released to a mini-zoo where she could live out her days in almost natural conditions. In 2011, a dog walker in Forsheim, Germany, alerted the police to a bird in the road that seemed oblivious to traffic. Officers discovered a brown owl staggering around with droopy eyelids and found two empty bottles of schnapps nearby. The officers brought the owl to an expert who had treated alcoholized birds before. Incidents of animals consuming alcohol are actually not uncommon. Birds, moose, even insects have been known to indulge in fermented fruits or human-made beverages. In this case, the owl's intoxication led to a humorous but dangerous situation on the road. Fortunately, no one was hurt during the bird's night of debauchery, and the owl was treated and released. In December of 2021, the small Welsh community of Buckley was terrorized by a gray squirrel nicknamed Stripes, who attacked 18 people and caused general chaos. Stripes, who had been fed by locals, became emboldened and aggressive, chasing adults, children, and pets. The attacks continued for over a day until a 65-year-old woman decided to capture Stripes to protect her grandchildren. Using a humane trap, she managed to capture the squirrel. Stripes' behavior underscores the risks of feeding wildlife and the potential for animals to become aggressive when they lose their natural fear of humans. Tell me about it. We have psycho squirrels here at Marlar Manor because we feed the birds and the furry rodents keep getting to the bulk of it. In September 2022, the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office arrested a goat named Billy for terrorizing residents, damaging property, and even assaulting a deputy. Billy's antics included destroying electrical equipment and chasing people. Held overnight until livestock control retrieved him, Billy's arrest was shared on Facebook, generating amusement and questions about the specifics of his detention. The post mentioned that Billy was charged with trespassing, assault, criminal damage, and disorderly conduct. While the charges were made in jest, of course, 
The arrest highlights the potential for even domesticated animals and pets to cause big problems. In May 2016, a boy fell into a gorilla enclosure at the Cincinnati Zoo, leading to the shooting of Harambe, an adult male gorilla, to protect the child. The incident sparked global outrage and became a viral sensation. The controversy highlighted the complex relationship between humans and animals in captivity. Conservationists and wildlife experts supported the zookeeper's decision, stating that the boy most certainly would have died if Harambe had not been stopped. However, the public outcry and subsequent meme culture that arose from the incident showed the emotional impact of such events and the power of social media in shaping public opinion. An Asiatic elephant named Osama bin Laden went on a two-year killing spree in awesome India killing 27 people between 2004 and 2006. Identified as a tuskless rogue bull, the elephant was feared by locals and ultimately shot dead in December 2006. The elephant's death was controversial, with some suspecting that the wrong animal was killed. The situation was dire, with locals referring to the elephant as a terrorist due to the destruction and fear it caused. Having the name Osama bin Laden probably didn't help. The decision to issue a shoot-to-kill order was met with mixed reactions, with some rejoicing at the end of the threat and others questioning the ethics and accuracy of the hunt. In 2021, a Polish animal control group called the Krakow Animal Welfare Society shared a story about a recent encounter that spooked the locals. A frightened woman called them, saying that she and her neighbors had seen a mysterious animal lurking in the trees outside their homes. The sight of it made many people avoid the area and keep their windows shut. Over the phone, the woman guessed it might be an iguana. Finding this odd, an inspector went to investigate. When they arrived and saw the creature, they initially thought the iguana might be dead. But as they got closer, they realized this animal had no head or limbs. For two days, residents were scared not by an exotic animal, but by a croissant stuck in a lilac tree. The inspector believes someone might have tossed the croissant to feed the birds and it got lodged in the tree. I know, this last story doesn't have a real animal in it, but I couldn't resist. It's a great story. Up next, did pterosaurs, the ancient flying reptiles, truly vanish millions of years ago, or do they still soar through our skies? We'll look at claims of modern-day sightings, some controversial theories, and a tantalizing photograph that challenges their extinction. Urban legends are thought by most to be tall tales passed down through the ages. Some of the stories are obviously make-believe, while others, as strange as they may seem, have their origins in actual events. Do alligators roam the dark tunnels deep beneath New York City? Do boogeymen who terrorize those afraid of the night really exist? Are killer clowns a myth born from our fear of the unknown, or could such evil truly walk among us? These are just a few of the urban legends that are explored in this book. After hearing some of the history for yourself, maybe you will be able to answer the age-old question, could it be true? Could It Be True, Volume 1, Urban Legends by Cindy Parmiter, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. The ancient allure of pterosaurs, those enigmatic flying reptiles that once dominated the skies continues to captivate the human imagination. Despite their presumed extinction millions of years ago, persistent reports and alleged sightings have fueled a controversial debate about the existence of living pterosaurs in the present day. We're going to delve into the historical context, 
eyewitness accounts, various theories, expeditions, skepticism from the scientific community, and even a mysterious photo that has added a touch of intrigue to the ongoing exploration of living pterosaurs. Pterosaurs, popularly known as the contemporaries of dinosaurs, soared through the skies from the late Triassic to the end of the Cretaceous period. Traditionally, scientists believed that these majestic creatures became extinct alongside their dinosaur companions. However, recent discoveries and ongoing scientific discussions have challenged this once steadfast belief, opening the door to speculation about the possibility of living pterosaurs. Through the years, a plethora of eyewitness accounts from different parts of the world have emerged, describing large, winged creatures that closely resemble the pterosaurs of ancient times. Descriptions include long beaks, leathery wings, and impressive wingspans, mirroring the characteristics observed in the fossil record. Skeptics often dismiss these accounts as misidentifications or hoaxes, attributing them to known birds, bats, or even flying drones. Nevertheless, the persistence of such reports has sparked interest and prompted enthusiasts to investigate further. Among the intriguing elements in the search for living pterosaurs is a mysterious photograph circulating within certain circles. The photo purportedly shows a pterosaur nailed to a barn surrounded by the people that killed it. The authenticity of the image is hotly debated, with some arguing it could be a cleverly crafted hoax or a misinterpretation of a different creature. While this photo adds an element of drama to the discourse, it also underscores the need for rigorous scientific scrutiny to separate fact from fiction in the search for living pterosaurs. You can see the photo by clicking the link to it that I've included in this episode's description. Proponents of the living pterosaur hypothesis propose various theories to explain their potential survival. Some suggest that small populations of pterosaurs might have endured the extinction event, adapting to changing environmental conditions. Others speculate that unknown species or descendants of ancient pterosaurs could still inhabit remote, unexplored regions of the world. These theories, while speculative, provide a framework for ongoing investigations. In response to the multitude of eyewitness accounts, several expeditions and investigations have been launched in an attempt to gather tangible evidence of living pterosaurs. Cryptozoologists, amateur researchers, and even a handful of scientists have ventured into regions with reported sightings, such as remote islands and dense rainforests. Despite their efforts, concrete evidence in the form of photographs, specimens, or biological samples remains elusive, leaving the scientific community skeptical. Mainstream scientists argue that many reported pterosaur sightings can be explained by misidentifications of known fauna, such as birds, bats, or drones. The lack of empirical evidence remains a significant challenge to the credibility of the living pterosaur hypothesis. But it is still fun to think about. Again, you can see the photos by clicking the links in the episode's notes. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Colossians 1 verses 13 and 14 for He has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. And a final thought, you will never get to where you ought to be if your life is spent wallowing in the discontent of where you are. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Darkness